Thanks for joining me up here. I um, am excited to delve into what is a very important topic, um, algorithmic bias, algorithmic accountability. Um, Brian, I wanted to just kick things off with you. Um, you're the founder of Kairos, a facial recognition software company, and you're actually doing a demo a little bit later today on the main stage, so quick plug. But um, <laughs> so, I, yeah, so it was, a, it was a few months ago you, you published this post on TechCrunch.com about how your company will never provide its facial recognition tools to law enforcement. Why is that? Yeah, we, we get concerned about algorithmic bias, actually, is like the core reason why. So, and for our regular use cases, we do facial recognition for like the Fortune 100, Fortune 500. These are people like banks, retailers. So, if we're wrong, at worst case, maybe you have to do a transfer again onto your, on your bank account. If we're wrong, maybe you don't see a, a, a picture uh, where you're in a, during a cruise line or something like that. But when the government is wrong about facial recognition, it's someone's life or liberty at stake, right? They could be putting you in a lineup you shouldn't be in, right? They could be saying that this person is a criminal when they're not. Uh, then with all the issues around just law enforcement in general, it then just kind of spirals out of control. And how does, I want to talk a little bit about the different types of biases, because what's the specific type of bias that, that, leads, to, that leads to some of the, the misclassification? So in the, there's all kinds of different kinds of bias, and we'll probably go through the different types, but in our world, uh, facial recognition is all about human biases, right? And so you think about AI and it's learning, it's like a child and you teach it things and then it learns more and more. What we call like right down the middle, right down the fairway is pale males. It's very, very good, very, very good identifying uh, somebody who meets that classification. Pale males. Pale male. Got that's it. like, that's right down the fairway. That's, you know. <laughs> I know some of them. Okay, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I've never actually heard it called that. I like that. Pale males. Pale walking around, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, as you get further, you know, further and further the fringes, right, you get, you know, women, folks of different ethnicities, darker skinned folks, even within, let's say, African Americans, you have different shades, right? The further you get from pale male, the harder it is for AI systems to get it right, or at least the confidence to get it right. And uh, Christian, maybe you can speak to this, but, but why is that? Sorry, why is that? Why, why is it that it, it gets harder it, the, the further away you get from pale males? So, you know, I think there are a couple different varieties of bias that we're talking about. And I think the one you're really getting at is sampling bias, right? So you have a lot of examples of, and it's funny because I hadn't heard that term before, so I'm probably gonna laugh now, but, um, you know, pale males. And so your, your training algorithm can learn a lot about those, those types of faces, right? But when you have other categories or maybe you have fewer examples, there's less data from which to learn. And so it's harder to make those classifications or harder to um, correctly identify people or, or whatever your application area is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And Patrick, there's another type of bias. There's, there's selection bias. Mm -hmm. What is that and how does it differ from the other types of biases? In a lot of contexts in which we want to use machine learning, we go out to find data that we can use to train whatever model it is we're going to apply to make predictions. Well, where do we get the training data? Uh, training data in a private sector context probably comes from business process. And if it comes from business process, you can be reasonably confident that the data you've captured is representative of your business process. So the only assumption you have to make is that the business process in the future will be similar to business process in the past, and you're good to go. Social data, particularly in the public sector, isn't like that at all. The way we get data from public sector processes is through administrative interaction with people. So think about policing data. How do the police get data on people? Well, police get a lot of data about people that they police intensely. Whether or not those people are criminal, they have frequent interactions with the police, and every one of those interactions becomes a data point, a database. People who rarely interact with the police have much less data about them in those databases. If you use those databases to train models about who is a criminal or who should be released uh, on pretrial release after they've been accused of a crime, the model will tend to think that people who have frequent interactions with the police are more criminal. Okay, so the consequence of more frequent interactions with the police is that you're more likely to have a more dangerous prediction from a model making a prediction about criminality. This can be catastrophic. What we're doing essentially in a model like this is reproducing the bias on the input into the predictions. 
And this is a very common problem in public data. Uh, it affects credit scoring. It affects all these criminal justice applications that I mentioned. Uh, and it affects national security applications of uh, risk classification. It's, it's, it's a giant, giant problem. And it's getting much, much worse. It's not getting better. So I mean, a lot of people call this algorithmic bias. But is it not just human bias that gets perpetuated by these algorithmic systems? Uh, yes and no. Uh, I'd say it's human, but I would move it away from bias at the individual level and call it bias at an institutional or structural level. If a police department is convinced they have to police a certain neighborhood, the individual racism, which may or may not be in the heart of any specific officer, is irrelevant. What's relevant is that the police department has made an institutional decision to, to over-police that neighborhood, thereby generating more police interactions in that neighborhood, thereby making people with that zip code more likely to be classified as dangerous if they are classified by a risk assessment algorithm. So it is, there is a mix of this kind of human and structural bias, but I think that our emphasis should be concerned, uh, should be focused on the structural bias. I have a parallel example. So in our world, a lot of algorithms are created in university. And universities do tend to skew pale male as well, right? And so what a, a professor will do is say, OK, I, I'll give you t 10 bucks to come in, give us 20 selfies, mm -hmm. that kind of thing, to any students, right? Hungry okay. college students, right? And so their original train data comes from that group. And therefore, the bias is implicit, though it isn't, to your point, the individual professor's goal. Mm -hmm. OK. And then, uh, Christian, um, you, do, you do a lot of work around, around fairness. And right. so first, I guess, first of all, what, what would a fair algorithm look like? Like, what, what does that mean? Yeah, you know, that's a great question and something that's been coming up a lot over the last couple of years in this sort of growing um, fairness, accountability, and transparency area in machine learning. And unfortunately, there is not a universally agreed upon definition of what fairness looks like. Um, this, this debate, I mean, it predated this particular article, but I think it really took off with this ProPublica article mm -hmm. about risk assessment, where they right. found that um, the rate at which black defendants were, were black defendants who did not go on to reoffend were classified as future recidivists was twice the rate of white defendants who did not go on to reoffend. Uh, re excuse me. Um, and so that was one definition that was put forward, right? The false positive rate for one group. So the, the sort of the burden of the errors was higher on one racial group than another racial group. Um, other people have looked at it from other sort of dimensions. They've looked at it from if you instead first think about the classification, look at, at what percent of people who are classified as high risk then go on to reoffend. This, this is it's a little bit hard to wrap your head around, but it's basically how you slice and dice the data can depend on what can determine whether you. Um, ultimately decide that the algorithm is unfair. And so a lot of the work over the last couple of years has really revolved around different mathematical definitions of fairness, um, which are sometimes and often mutually incompatible. You can't have both at the same time. And so I think you know, what makes an algorithm fair is highly contextually dependent. And it's going to it's gonna depend so much on the training data that's going into it. The training data, will off, it'll often be a little bit circular. So the training data will determine how you evaluate whether the algorithm's fair. Mm -hmm. If we have these problems, for example, where say one group is over um, classified by the humans as say being being recidivist because they're arrested at a higher rate, it's even hard to make those determinations where the, of whether the algorithm itself is fair because you're comparing to some sort of biased and imperfect mm -hmm. gold standard, right? And so, um, yeah, it, it's really going to be contextually dependent. You're going to have to understand a lot about the problem. You're going to have to understand a lot about the data. And even, um, even when that happens, I think you know, there will, will still be disagreements about which of the sort of mathematical definitions of fairness are most appropriate in which context. If I could figure yeah, on that. Too. Yeah. These guys are so good, I'm just going to keep just piggybacking on that. Yeah, please do. Um, <laughs> so one of the issues with AI, and that people are really working on a lot, and we're going to show this in my demo later, uh, is they don't know why AI came to a conclusion sometimes, mm -hmm. right? And so you go out, you train it, it goes in this magic black box, and then you send in data, and you get an, an output. Um, so more and more uh, people are starting to ask the AI to explain the logic, which will help us to figure out you know, if that's biased or not biased. Yeah, and I mean, for you, how, how easy would that be for you to explain how your software landed on this person? So easy. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would say up until 
earlier this year, we couldn't okay. at all. In fact, um, again, later I'm going to show that now we can and we think we, we cracked it, but essentially we've had to create a system and use partners as well to show us a vision of what the computer is seeing mm -hmm. so that we can then verify how the AI sees, essentially. Okay. And is that, is that transparent? Or is that, I mean, is that transparent to like the end user or is that just for your company's own? I'd like to make it transparent. It only yeah. was kind of invented in the last six months. Okay, so. got it. Yeah. And then, Christian, just, uh, just going back to, to fairness a little bit, I mean, I guess I just thought of when the, the ACLU, they, they ran um, some facial recognition software. Was it Amazon's recognition that they ran um, to identify Congress members and they only got the pale males correct, <laughs> essentially. Right. So I feel like that's an example of, okay, clearly there's something wrong with this algorithm, but like, if you were to be able to go in and like, look at that specific algorithm and that, that process, how would you conclusively determine um, like, with the stats, with the data to back it up that that was not a fair process? You know, I think a lot of people, or probably not in this room, but many people think that when we're talking about biased algorithms or we're talking about problematic algorithms that, you know, the sort of human component of the bias really derives from somebody sitting there and being like, oh, if, you know, if not pale male, then misclassify or something right. like that, right? Yeah. Where there's some sort of malicious intent that, that went into it. And by and large, I think at least in the examples I've seen, that's not true. It's not like there's somebody sitting there, um, you know, if female don't hire or something like that, right? It, that, that's just not how this works. Right. Um, and so that would probably be the easiest sort of thing to audit, right? Mm -hmm. If you could actually get a look at the code, you could look in and see, okay, did somebody, you know, maliciously try to discriminate against a certain group? But, but I mean, fortunately, I almost said unfortunately, unfortunately from the point of view of the audit, but fortunately from the point of view of you know, our, our vision of humanity, that's by and large not what's happening. Um, and so in order to do that sort of audit, I think, you know, when we're talking about transparency, we have to really go back to the beginning. And again, to sort of keep coming back to the same points, I think all of us are making over and over, we really need to get back to the input data and to see the training data that's, um, you know, training the model. So for example, if you have, I think this is the, the first question you, that we discussed was if your data set is overrepresenting, say the pale male demographic, then there's reason to believe that your classifications might be poor mm -hmm. um, on, on, you know, that come out of the model that's been trained with that data. And so that's probably where I would start um, on looking at a system like that. But there are of course a lot of other points at which you might want to do some evaluation. Unfortunately, um, in a lot of cases, it's easier to get access to something like an API or something like a model description or a paper that was written about the um, development process as opposed to the data itself or in many cases sort of the what is perceived as the boring details of the data, sort of like the cleaning and all these decisions that are made from the very beginning. Like how are you even um, classifying the data that's being, that's being put into it sort of end up being just obscured because it's for a lot of people, not that interesting, but in my opinion, probably one of the most important components of understanding what types of biases you're likely to see coming out of a model that's learning patterns in that particular mm -hmm. data set. Yeah. And if I could jump oh, in yeah, there. For sure. I think there's a couple of questions that users of systems like this can ask about how the model was trained that would inform whether or not it's likely that the outputs of the model would be uh, biased. And I keep saying model rather than algorithm because the model is the result of combining an algorithm, which could be a perfectly good algorithm, with training data, which may be appallingly bad. Mm. So the question is first to think about what is the input data after it's gone through the cleaning that Christian focuses on and ask, what's not there? What in the universe to which I intend to apply this model is missing from the input data? And it can be that simple. Or do we have too many of one category and not enough of some other category? Well, the model may learn more poorly about the less well-represented category and have a, a higher error rate for that category. Think about those dimensions uh, in a way that is rigorous. And it's fortunate that we have 100 years of applied statistics that tells us how to do this. This is the language here is statistical representativity and, and sampling. So how did the sampling work for your training data? If it was just a pile of crud you found somewhere, that may not be your best foot forward. Uh, but if you thought really carefully about how you sampled the space to which you intend to apply the prediction, in order to create your training data, then that gives you a much better shot at having a less biased outcome. 
Uh, in the old days, people used to say about computer uh, predictions or computer analysis, garbage in, garbage out. Mm -hmm. Let's move on. I think that the appropriate statement we should use now is, if bias in, then bias out. So think hard about the input data. I, I think one clarification there is, or maybe just addition is really important, which is that you know, the word bias is used in a lot of different ways, right. and this is something we were talking about a little bit earlier, where you might mean, you know, sort of maybe even implicit bias or intentional bias or, you know, the, the, how you use it colloquially or in sort of the media. But if you have a data set like we're talking about that exhibits selection bias, so some people are more likely to end up in the data set than other people, that doesn't necessarily have to come from malicious intent. It could come from the fact, like Patrick is saying, you found this data set somewhere, and maybe this data set is very useful for what it was created for. So it doesn't necessarily have to dovetail so perfectly with um, sort of the negative connotations you might have about the word bias. We're sort of, we're sort of mixing a lot of... Um, you know, heavily loaded words with technical definitions, and so I think it's important to think very carefully about um, selection bias, even sort of divorced from what, whatever emotions might come up with that word in yeah. particular. I think those last comments, too, also tie home really your first question, uh, the public versus private, right? Mm -hmm. So facial recognition in a, in a public sense should be auditable by outside groups to make sure, to your point, the model, right, is correct, all that goes into it, mm -hmm. right? Um, facial recognition in the private sense, you know, for, for us, that's intellectual property, right? And so, you know, we've processed now a billion faces. Um, and so all that data creates a stronger algorithm. That strong algorithm is why people choose Kairos over something else. Now, if you're using a police use case, you should be able to audit that information, right, because it's that important. Um, and again, if you're, for us, for our business customers, you know, again, that's, that's IP. Yeah, and I mean, in, in the private sense, I mean, the, the cost of failure isn't necessarily that, that huge. And like, even if you think of, okay, a basic um, algorithmic model on, on Google, like, okay, maybe Google's algorithm gets it wrong, but maybe you're just shown a weird search result. Like, it's not going to change your life. Um, Patrick, could you talk a little bit about the, the cost of failure in these, in these models? Yeah, and here I really want to talk to people, reach out to people in this audience who are building machine learning applications. What happens if your predictions are wrong? Who pays that cost? I'm pretty sure it is unlikely to be you, right? If you serve the wrong ad and somebody gets a sneaker ad when they were looking for a boot ad, meh. Not big cost, right? The customer doesn't really suffer, the, the, the manufacturer doesn't suffer, and you don't really suffer. It's just not that big a deal. It's a little bit of noise. But if you build an algorithm which deploys police into a neighborhood over and over again because the police keep arresting people there, and you over-police that neighborhood, and you create a crisis of public legitimacy between the community and the police, now we have a spectacular problem, notwithstanding all the people who got arrested in that neighborhood for trivial crimes, and notwithstanding the people who maybe should have been arrested in some other neighborhood, but weren't because the police were over-focusing on the first neighborhood. Criminal justice, in my opinion, is probably the sharpest example of a very, very high cost of failure in machine learning applications. And we have a dense application of these tools in criminal justice applications, and they're getting it wrong, and we're seeing people suffer. This is a big problem. So if you're thinking about building a tool, spend some time with a red team thinking about what can go wrong with this tool. Who will suffer? And if you can build the tool, maybe make a little money on it, but not bear the cost of being wrong, if some other community bears the cost of being wrong, maybe as an ethical concern, you should take on that externality as part of your calculation about whether the tool should be built at all. Because the cost of failure can be catastrophic. And it's not hypothetical anymore. Uh, and if people want to talk afterwards, I'll be happy to read the list of vendors who are enthusiastically making these mistakes. I'll just say IBM because they're in the news today. Um, and this is a big, big problem. Yeah, and I mean, maybe for those who haven't, um, who haven't seen that news, do you just want to talk a little bit about that? What's going so, on? So, yeah, IBM? IBM and the New York Police Department have developed a tool to classify the race of someone in uh, an image that is captured in surveillance footage or body-worn camera footage. Uh, <laughs> classifying people by race has a, a long and sordid history of massive abuse um, 
not only in our own country, but internationally. And this should be incredibly obvious, I think, to anyone with even a passing idea about what police departments are likely to do with that information. So we need to be really, really careful not to build those tools, because once they get built and integrated into administrative procedures, it's really, really hard to remove them, fix them, or reform them. So we need to stop them at the point of not building them. But the larger generic point that I'll close with is think about the application of your tool. What can go wrong? And in public contexts, especially the biased data, a lot can go wrong. I just want to close with another 15 seconds. I am not a machine learning hater. My two biggest projects that I work on in my day job right now are both machine learning centric. In one, I predict where in Mexico we will find disappeared people in mass graves. Uh, and in a second, I link different kinds of databases about war casualties to find the repeated mentions of a single individual across uh, databases that include hundreds of thousands of people. So I love machine learning tools. I am not an anti-machine learning person at all. I am very, very concerned about the credulous and naive use of machine learning in contexts where it's inappropriate and the cost of being wrong is very high. Christian, you do, you do a lot of work in, in pretrial and uh, predictive policing. I mean, have you seen any, any good examples of machine learning in, in those areas? So, sure. I, you know, I, I was reading an article not too long ago about use of machine learning to go through past records of people whose um, records should be expunged because of marijuana convictions. Right, so th in that case, I think that's a great use of machine learning because it's sort of helping to make more efficient this policy that we, that we need to get you know, pushed through. We need to get people who have sort of suffered from past abuses off, those rec off the, their records you know, cleaned up so they don't continue to suffer from those abuses. I think when we're looking at cases where we're making predictions about someone's behavior in the future, often where there's not a whole lot of difference between the two groups, so you say someone's high risk versus low risk, um, I think those are a lot more dangerous, um, particularly because, you know, sort of speaking to the maybe business applications, if you're able to get some sort of marginal increase in predictive accuracy, maybe in click-through rate or something like that, maybe you make a ton of money and you're really happy. Say you get some sort of small separation between this person, this person, and their probability of um, future rearrest, which again would be different than future reoffense, but even, even sort of ignoring that difference. Um, is, is that sort of marginal difference enough to make a decision about someone's life and liberty, like we were talking mm -hmm. about earlier? So really recognizing the, the differences in application areas and not thinking that something that maybe, even though it will make you a million dollars or, I mean, maybe even more, right, it, by getting some sort of tiny increase in predictive accuracy or machine learning was a, was a useful tool in that case that it doesn't necessarily translate to other cases where we're making very different types of decisions. Let's say that, that these algorithmic models were 100% accurate, had no, somehow didn't have any bias whatsoever, which of course it's probably not ever going to happen. It's the dream. But what was that, Brian? It's the dream, right? Right, exactly. Um, in, in that scenario, which of course won't happen, would, like Brian, with you, I mean, would you still be anti law enforcement using facial recognition? Well, it, uh, even though I, I joke, it actually is mathematically possible. It is. Yeah, absolutely. For there to be no. Yeah, if you figure. Right. So if you can do something for the pale male, right? If you can be 99.99% right, you can be that right for other groups. You just have to have enough data, mm -hmm. you know, for the other groups. Um, and so, in a 100% world, would I be okay? I would say no. And, and, and here's why. Again, so if if this convention center was one of my customers, mm -hmm. and they wanted to set up like an, like an easy pass lane, which a lot of our customers do. Yeah. Um, you just want to walk in, no searching, no scanning, just kind of walk in. Um, because we've got a picture of you that you gave us earlier. That's a, that's a good use case, but the convention center doesn't know who every single person's audience is unless they give them their picture. Mm -hmm. With government, they have all of our passport photos, all of our driver's license photos. They could put a camera on Main Street and know every single person driving by. And we just recently, in the last month, turned down a government request. I don't know why they keep asking us to do stuff when we say we don't, we're gonna work for government, by the way. They're not reading TechCrunch. Mm -hmm. um, but they, they came to, Homeland Security came to us asking for facial recognition for people behind moving cars, hmm. right? And this isn't the NSA or people outside of the US, this is Homeland Security, right? So these wow. are 
using facial recognition on Americans driving by, right? That's for us, that's completely unacceptable. Yeah, and I mean, I guess what's scary is that, I mean, sure, you said no, but they'll probably just go to a different company. Yeah, somebody and ask will them. say yes, yeah. yeah. We need legislation in this area, and I'm, I'm, we're all for legislation. And can yeah. I have one more thing to that, yeah. actually? You know, even if we could have 100% perfect accuracy in predicting something, the question is at predicting what, right? So again, mm -hmm. sort of back to the context that we keep talking about, usually the thing you're trying to predict in a lot of these cases is something like rearrest. So even if we are perfectly able to predict that, we're still left with the problem that sort of the human or systemic or institutional biases are generating biased arrests, right? And so you, ha you still have to contextualize even your 100% accuracy um, with is the data really measuring what you think it's measuring? Mm -hmm. Is the data itself generated by, by a fair process? And if I can close that, yeah. What would it mean for the police to have perfect information about every crime committed constantly in society? In order to build a fair machine learning system, we would need to live in a society of perfect surveillance so that there is absolute police knowledge about every single crime so that nothing is excluded so that there would be no bias. Let me suggest to you that that's way worse even than a bunch of crimes going free. So maybe we should just work on reforming police practice and forget about all of the machine learning distractions because they're really making things worse, not better. So before we introduce machine learning into law enforcement, let's first fix law enforcement. That's kind of issue number one. Yeah. yeah. For fair predictions, you first need a fair criminal justice system. Right. And which we don't have. We have a ways to go. To produce the fair data with which to train right. the model. Yeah. All right. That's a bigger well. problem. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, we have we have a long way to go, unfortunately. But thank you so much, everyone, for your time. Yeah. It was a great thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks.